Good morning, everyone. You guys doing all right? Hey, can I just say quick before I start, I know a lot of different pastors. I'm connected with a lot of different churches. I uh, know a lot of different people that go to different churches. And uh, I can honestly say that our leadership here between Pastor Jeff and Pastor Weaver has been so incredible through this time. They've carried such a burden. They've led us so well. They always lead with love and, and humility. And so I am thankful to be under that leadership. I would not want to be anywhere else right now and, or at any other church because we have the best leadership. Do you guys agree with that? Can we give them a hand? We love you guys. You lead so well. So you got me this morning. For anyone watching online, we're glad to have you this morning. Mass service. My people, we love you. Um, we are continuing this morning in our Roman series, uh, still in chapter one. If you were here last week, Pastor Jeff shared an awesome message on the first half of chapter one. And I get the task and drew the short straw to do the second half of chapter one. If you can recall the second half of chapter one, it's a little bit of doom and gloom. So I'm going to do my best to throw it back and give you all the fire and brimstone I can this morning. Are you guys ready for it? I got no fire and brimstone in me, but I'm going to try. But I'm going to try. So um, being a youth pastor is super fun uh, and I love it. And some things that I love most is when I give certain sermon illustrations, when I get to speak or just talking with students. It's really crazy to me uh, that one, we have students in our ministry right now that were born after 2000. Isn't that crazy? Makes you feel old, doesn't it? But we have students that would, uh, I, I like to talk about, you know, back in the old days when I just had a, a phone that flipped open and it had a keyboard that was like the coolest thing. It didn't have internet. Literally all I could do on it was call or text. Like we didn't have smartphones. We didn't have apps. Uh, how many of you guys remember those days? How many of you remember the days pre-internet? Pre-internet, that is, you guys are crazy. I don't know how you survived, you know. Uh, I was going to say, Pastor Weaver's not here this morning, but if you wanted to find out uh, what it was like before electricity, you could ask him. <laughs> he would probably know. So, sorry, he's not here to defend himself, so I can jab all I want. But, uh, you know, it's funny with students to talk about, you know, not having GPS or maps. Like, we take advantage, like, of that often, right? Without even realizing how often you just pull up Google Maps or Apple Maps. And I remember when I got my license, I had a, uh, when I was 16, I had a 97 Jeep Cherokee. Um, that was actually, I got it from my wonderful grandma and granddad. Uh, and uh, I remember going to see friends and stuff and just having my, my dumb phone. And if I went to a place I didn't know where I was going, I would have to, before I left, I would have to go on the computer and I would have to print a MapQuest. Do you remember that? MapQuest, the directions, one by, step by step, and then print out this paper, sometimes two pages, and carry it with me while I was driving. And if I messed up those directions and I got lost, too bad. I didn't have a phone to pull up and just Google where I was at or that knew my location. Uh, I would have to call home. Oh, my dad's working. Oh, mom's not at home by the computer. Let's call my sister. She's the only one with, in the family that has a phone at that time. Oh, she doesn't have access to the computer right now. Well, <laughs> I'm on my own. I just got to find my own way. And I, that happened to me so many times, you know. And, and it's just funny. Students, like, cr they can't even grasp that. They're like, what? It's like mind-blowing to them. How did, you know, how did we survive without internet? How do we survive with that? But, you know, I was thinking while preparing this message, and God really laid on my heart, as we'll see kind of a theme of Romans, especially where we're going this morning, is that when you go to search a destination, you want to go somewhere on a road trip, you, you put in the destination, right? And now our phones automatically plug in our location. But you would have to plug in two locations in order to get proper directions, right? Where you're going and where you're at. 
If you're at the mall or the Mall of America or an airport or something, you look for the big old you are here, right? You have to find that in order to get to where you're going. And it's really important, the destination, but I would say it is equally important to know your location. Because uh, in, in, if you don't know where you're, you are, you cannot accurately know where you're going or how to get there, right? And so I think spiritually in our faith and who we are as Christians, in order to know where you're going, you need to know where you are at. You need to have a humble and accurate and honest assessment of where am I in order so I need to know and figure out where I am going. And we're going to do that this morning. I want to take an honest look of where we are at this morning. And that's really the flow of Romans. The flow of Romans uh, is, is in a description Paul tells us where we're at. He tells us where we need to go. And then he tells us how Jesus got us there. And so we're going to go through that this morning, starting in Romans verse 1, or chapter 1, excuse me, verse 18. Bear with me, this is a lot of verses. Uh, but God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. They know the truth about God because he has made it obvious to them. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God had made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. So they have no excuse for not knowing God. Yes, they knew God, but they wouldn't worship him as God or even give thanks, give him thanks. And they began to think of foolish ideas of what God was like. As a result, their minds became dark and confused. Claiming to be wise, they instead became utter fools. And instead of worshiping the glorious, ever-living God, they worshiped idols made to look like mere people, birds, animals, and reptiles. So God abandoned them. God gave them up to do whatever shameful things their hearts desired. That's a heartbreaking verse. God abandoned them to do whatever the shameful things their hearts desired. As a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. They traded the truth about God for a lie. So they worshiped and served things God created instead of the creator himself, who is worthy of eternal praise. Amen. That is why God abandoned them to their shameful desires. Even the women turned against the natural way to have sex and instead indulged in sex with each other. And the men, instead of having normal sexual relations with women, burned with lust for each other. Men did shameful things with other men. As a result of this sin, they suffered within themselves the penalty they deserved. Since they thought it foolish to acknowledge God, he abandoned them to their foolish thinking and let them do things that, they should, never, that should never be done. Their lives became full of every kind of wickedness, greed, sin, hate, envy, murder, quarreling, deception, malicious behavior, and gossip. They're backstabbers, haters of God, insolent, proud, and boastful. They invent new ways of sinning and they disobey their parents. They refuse to understand, they break their promises, are heartless and have no mercy. They know God's justice requires that those who do these things deserve to die, yet they do them anyway. Worse yet, they encourage others to do them too. <sighs> All right, have a good lunch. Go watch some football. Hopefully you feel inspired after reading that. It's not a very fun section to read, but it is necessary. Because when Paul says they in here, he's including us. He's including, he's including all of humanity is included in that. He's, he further says later that, that we are all sinful and wicked people. In Romans 3.23, Paul says, For everyone, for all have sinned, and we all fall short of, of God's glorious standard. We're all sinners. We all fall into that category. That is where we are at this morning. That is a spiritual, you are here. That is who we are. And it's not fun to read, like I said, but it needs to be an honest assessment. The Greek word for sin, and often used for sin, is, is hamartia. And it comes from a word, an ancient word that means to miss the mark. To miss the mark. That word actually was an archery term. 
And so back in those days, when an archer would get up for the games, he would draw back, and if he had, he had a bullseye, he had a target that he had to hit, he had a mark that he was aiming for, and it was a term referred to, I missed it completely. I completely missed the target. I missed the mark. Uh, I, I had a specific goal, and I missed it. I did what I wasn't supposed to do or wasn't what was intended. See, sin isn't just making a mistake. It's not just making a bad decision. It's not just disobedience from God. But sin is missing the whole point of human life. Sin is missing what God intended. It's missing his purpose and not living up to his glorious standard. God created the universe and everything in it. And he called it good. He created perfect systems, systems of nature. He, his, his relationship with humanity was perfect. What he saw in his creation was good. And we had a perfect relationship with God. But God loved us so much, and he still does, that he didn't create us as robots. He said, I will give you the choice to love me and obey me because true love can't be forced so Adam and Eve had the choice and they chose wrong. He had perfect plans, intentions, and a life set up for us. And that was his way and his mark. But humans chose another way. We chose our own way and we missed it. And our way, our missing of the mark, it has consequences. It, it causes pain. It causes hurt. See, think about it. Guilt and shame didn't enter the picture until we started choosing our own way. Guilt and shame are not from God. They are consequences of our own way. And if you really look at sin and what it is, and look at God, he isn't some jealous dictator that is controlling and self-conscious and needy that just sits on his throne. He doesn't want us to obey him because he needs it. He, it's because we need it. His way is not for him, it's for us. His way is not for him, it is for us and our benefit. All the promises, all the commands, all the law in the Bible isn't for him. It's not to just satisfy some hunger to control you. It truly is for you and your benefit, not for God. He wants you to love him. He wants you to follow him. Why? Because it's the best way. It's the way with the least consequences. He isn't trying to limit your life or keep you from things. He's trying to protect you. And if anything he's going to keep you from, it'll be from consequence or cost or penalty. Romans 6, 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. The wages, the cost, the price, the consequences, the penalty is death. Missing the mark that God has leads us to death. It leads to spiritual death because we can't live without Jesus. It leads us to spiritual, eternal death, the separation from God. But also it causes death in this life as well. It, it leads to death to joy, peace, purpose, death to strength and hope, death to the blessings that God has and the plans. It could cause death in even more physical things. It could cause death in relationships, death to opportunities, to jobs, to health. Sin has a cost, a cost, and it hurts people. Those consequences that cost, it hurts us and it hurts people. When we sin, somebody gets hurt and it leads us away from God. And I know that God hates sin because it hurts his people. God truly hates sin because it hurts his sons and daughters and it separates us from him. He loves us so much and sin causes a rift. And that's why he wants us to love and obey him. But why would God set up this system where we can't even get close to it, we'll always miss the mark, we're sinful, we couldn't be perfect, we, we can't hit the bullseye, we can't even hit the target? Why would, why would he put a death penalty on sin? Why does it have to be that harsh? It's a great question. It's not because of a system God put in place. It truly is, because, it's rather because of who he is. And once we truly understand who God is, 
we, we get to understand the standard that he has. What do I mean by that? God is holy. Turn to your neighbor and say, God is holy. Come on, people. Wake up for me. God is holy. He is holy. To be holy means to be distinct, to be separate. In a class by oneself, so high above everyone else. The actual word holy, uh, the ancient word means separate. Separate. It means to, to cut as well. That's where we get our phrase, a cut above the rest. Holy. Perhaps even more accurate to call God would be a cut above us. Just so much greater, so much better. And as we talk about the holiness of God, it only secondarily refers to God's moral purity. Firstly, it refers to just simply how much greater he is, how set apart. We're not even in the same class as him. We, he is matchless. There's nobody like him. He's incomparable. He is uncreated. There's, there's nobody that rivals him. He has no equal, no competition. He's in a league of his own. He's fully complete and fully pure. If I could illustrate it to help us understand, if you think about our solar system as a bunch of planets and one sun, and that sun is powerful. Powerful. It is set apart from the planets. Even the big planets cannot compare to our sun in our, in our solar system. That sun also, you remove the sun from our solar system, we don't have life. That sun is a source of life, it is unique, it is set apart, and it is powerful. And if you were to get in a rocket ship and fly towards the sun, what would happen to you? You would burn up like a s'more and die. You would die. Is that because the sun is so evil and hateful and bad that you would die? No. It's because the sun is so good and so powerful and so set apart that we die. God is the same way. He is all powerful. He is set apart. He is holy. He's our source of life. And just who we are as created beings, as impure beings, the very presence of God is dangerous to us. That is how holy he is. We can't even get close to him. You see in the New Testament, or in both New and Old Testament, people would have an experience with just a glimpse of the presence of God and they would be trembling for their lives. They would be in absolute fear. And they would, a lot of times you read, they would be, after the whole ordeal ended, they would be praising God that they still had life. That is who our God is. He is holy. He is set apart from us. Revelation chapter 4 gives us a glimpse into his throne room. I challenge you to read the whole chapter, but I'm going to start in verse 8. Each of these living beings had six wings, and their wings were covered all over with eyes, inside and out. Day after day and night after night, they kept on saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty. The one who was and who is and, and who is still to come. Whenever the living beings give glory and honor and thanks to the one sitting on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down and they worship the one sitting on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever, and they lay their crowns before the throne and they say, you are worthy. O oh Lord, our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things and they exist because you created what you pleased. Another verse, Exodus 15, 11, who is like you among the gods, O oh Lord, glorious in holiness, awesome in splendor, performing great wonders. I could go on and on and on verses in the Bible that describe how amazing, how great, how majestic, how powerful, and how holy our God is. And I love this thought, is that the Bible says God is holy, holy, holy. It doesn't just say he's holy. It doesn't just say he's holy, holy. It says he is holy, holy, holy. The Bible never says that God is love, love, love. It never says he's justice, 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 or good, 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 or mercy, 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 or wrath, wrath, wrath. But the only time it describes God like that is when it's saying he is holy, holy, 
holy to try to just give us a small glimpse and taste of truly how set apart he is. Billy Graham says it perfectly. Only when we understand the holiness of God will we truly understand the depth of our sin. Only when we start to even closely grasp how amazing and how set apart God is will we truly look at us and go, wow, I am dust. I am weak. All I can give to God is filthy rags. That's my sin. That's who I am. I'm impure. I'm so beneath you, God. It causes us to realize where we are at. You are here. We are here in this place. So weak, so small. God is so set apart from us. How could we even come close to him without being crushed under the weight of who he is? We can't. See, God could take away all my possessions, my job, my family, my health, my relationships, everything. He could even strike me down and kill me and leave me in a ditch and he would have done no wrong. He would have done no wrong. That's how holy he is. It's me. I am so far from that standard, that bar that he sets because he's holy and we can never reach it. You can never reach that bar, that standard of holiness. That's why it says in Romans 24, that God abandoned us to our desires. We wanted something else. He gave us up and over to us so we could choose to miss the mark. And that's why it says his wrath was unleashed. His wrath is letting us go to our consequences. He knew there was penalty. He knew there was consequences. He's a good father, but he said, I'm a, uh, that is fine. I'm going to let you choose and I'll let you do your thing even if it costs you everything. And he led us over. He knew our sins had a cost, and he knew that they had to be paid. But knowing the consequences, why? Why? Why did we choose? Why did we choose? Why did Adam and Eve choose something other than God's plan? Why do we still choose instead of God's way? It's because they were lied to. Verse 18 that we read says, We suppress the truth with our wickedness. We suppressed the truth with our wickedness. We traded truth for a lie. See, God's way is the truth. His perfect plan for us is the truth. And the lie started with Satan in the Garden of Eden. He told Adam and Eve a lie that consisted of two parts. The first part was, you will not die if you disobey God, and you'll be like God. You won't die and you'll be like God. He specifically lied to them saying, you won't have consequences to this. You can do your own thing. You can go your own way. It'll be good. And then he also said, man, you can be like God. See, all sin, all sin, all areas of missing the mark starts with a lie. If you look at your life, anytime you've messed up, disobeyed, fallen short, missed the mark, or sinned. Anytime, you can trace it back to a single lie. And it usually has something to do with, there's no consequences, it's all good, and you can be your own God. You're in control, you're in charge. And we abandon the truth that we're not. Think of every sin, even listed here that Paul says, even going against God's natural design with homosexuality starts with a lie. Wickedness, greed, hate, envy, murder, deception, malicious behavior, gossip, being proud, boastful, insolent, disobeying your parents, refusing to understand, breaking your promises, having no mercy. It all starts with a lie. Everything can be traced back to a lie. And, and Adam and Eve believed that lie, that it'd be all good and that they will be like God. See, a Satan wanted Adam and Eve to worship themselves. Think about who Satan was. His name was Lucifer. He was pretty high up in heaven with God. He was in charge of worship. And what did he do? He started saying, I don't think God deserves to worship. I think I do. I want to start worshiping myself. I want to be like God. Satan's been saying this from the beginning. That got him kicked out of heaven. 
got a third of the angels kicked out with him that wanted to follow suit. And he's still trying to get us to do the same thing, to worship ourselves instead of God. And Satan lies to get us to worship things other than God. Worship idols, worship creation instead of the creator, and to worship ourselves. Verses 21 through 23 say that that we didn't worship God, instead we worshiped his creation. You're his creation. We worshiped ourselves and other things that God created. Because worship is, it's not just singing. Worship is giving authority to something. Worship is putting something above yourself, serving that thing, following something. We were created from the start to worship. So you are always worshiping something. And you get to choose. Will you believe the lie and worship yourself? Or go in God's way and worship him. See, truly, we are most like Satan when we are worshiping ourselves rather than God. That's when we're most like Satan. Because that's who he is. You're always putting something first in your life. Always serving something or giving authority away. Bad things are good things. What you put first in your life is what you worship. What you give the most time to, money to, emotion, effort, focus on, that's what you are worshiping. What are you worshiping this morning? Who are you worshiping this morning? We try to be like the God of our own lives. And that doesn't work. We're not in charge. And that's not something that's taught or learned just ask a two-year-old or a three-year-old, we always want to be in charge. We always want to be in charge. We always want to be like God. See, I've talked to many people that have a really hard time with Christianity. They love the fact that God's a provider. They love the fact that God is the blesser, that he's got great plans, that I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. They love that. They love that Jesus died and saved them from their sins. But they have a really hard time with Jesus as their Lord, Jesus as their king, Jesus as in charge. And I think people want to accept Jesus as their savior, but not their Lord. They love the thought of a savior, but not a master, not a king. And I think this causes many people to want to be saved from their sins or not want to be saved from their sins. They just want to be saved from the penalty of their sins. And I don't want that to ever be me. I don't want ever to get to the place where I still want to be in charge, but I'm just afraid of the cost. I'm just afraid of the penalty. God, would you just take care of that, but I'm going to still do my own thing. That's not what God's calling us to do. That's not worship. My mom used to say to me all the time, you're not sorry, you're just sorry you got caught. I think God says that to me a lot. You're not actually sorry you chose that. You wanted to choose it. You wanted to be in charge. You're just sorry because you got caught. You're sorry because the consequences are coming. You know what I mean? I don't want to be like that as a follower of Jesus. Because being being in charge is costly. Worship team, would you come at this time? It's costly because somebody has to pay it. There's a separation there between us and God. There are many people, one, sadly, that don't think hell is a real place. It is a very real place. Unfortunately, a lot of Christians don't even believe hell is a real place because they don't want to focus on it. But there are also as many people that think hell was created for you and for me if we disobey God. Hell was not created for you. Hell was not created for me. It was created for Satan and his demons. It was. It was a place that God said, all right, you want to do that? Here you go. That's not, it's not intended for us. Hell is not intended for you. God doesn't want you to go there. He's not a, it's not a place he just sends people he's mad at. That's not it. Here's what hell is. Hell is a place where you have the option to pay for your own sins. It's a place where we know we had a cost. Something has to be paid for going our own way. And then we're choosing instead of Jesus paying my sins, you know what? I'll pay for it. I'll go to hell. I don't get sent there, I choose to go there to pay for my own sins. 
And so Jesus dying on the cross, it wasn't just a grand display of love. It wasn't just a demonstration of power and his deity. It was way more than that. It was him paying your bill, covering the cost. He gave all of his life a perfect, sinless son of God. And you think about it, God saying the wrath of God was letting us to our consequences, the death penalty. Jesus took the full wrath of his heavenly father instead of us. He took the full punishment and penalty to pay what we racked up as a bill. And Jesus didn't miss the mark. He was perfect. He was sinless. He didn't deserve it. And that's why it says, because God's own son, we are made right in God's eyes. He can look at us and go, it's paid. In fact, the last words Jesus said on the cross were, it's paid in full. The literal translation of that word is paid in full. Isn't that amazing? Jesus is our holiness. God is so set apart, he's so above, but we accept the free gift that God gives, that Jesus died on the cross, he paid for it. When we accept that, he comes into our life and he, he is our holiness. That's where we get access to a holy God without dying. Jesus, through Jesus alone do we have access to God. That separation is cut. The bridge is made. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, For God made Christ who never sinned to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. Let me ask you this morning, do you want to pay your own bill or do you want to have it paid for you? If you were in a restaurant, it would be a no-brainer. Hopefully for your life and your eternity, it would need be a no-brainer. But I don't want to just accept that free gift and still believe a lie and still try to be in charge and still try to worship myself. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. I have to go all in. Would you stand all across this place? We're going to go into a time of worship and just glorifying God for his holiness and who he is and his faithfulness. But I want to give an opportunity to anyone in this place that would say, you know what, Pastor Luke, I, I haven't accepted that free gift and that payment. I'm racking up a bill and I want it paid. I want to give my whole life. I want to start worshiping somebody other than myself. If that's you in this place, would you bow your heads and close your eyes? I just want to give you an opportunity to respond. And if that's you, I want to, I want to support you. I want to pray for you. Would you just raise your hand if you say, that's me. I, I want that free gift. I, I want to be full in where worship God. Yeah, I see your hand, absolutely. Praise Jesus. It's paid for you. It's paid for me. I see your hand. He's paid for you. Praise God. For anyone else in this place, you would say, yeah, I've accepted the free gift, but I've been racking up some more debt. I want to start to worship him. I'm, I'm done believing a lie. I'm done worshiping myself. I, I know now where I'm at, and I'm thankful that Jesus gets me to where I need to go. And I recognize that, and I want to serve him. That's you in this place. I want to just encourage you to worship God for his holiness. So Jesus, we thank you for those who responded saying, accepting your free gift and accepting to worship you instead of themselves. And God, we give ourselves as living sacrifices. That's our spiritual act of worship. Whatever you want, you're in charge, Jesus. And we thank you for that payment that was your life so that we could even be in this room with you right now and not die. Thank you, Jesus, in your mighty and holy name. Amen. Thank you so much, God, that you loved us so much. You did everything you could to get us in relationship with you. You sacrificed your own son. You, you gave out all your wrath on him. We are so undeserving. We thank you for that free gift. You didn't charge us anything. God, and truly, truly our only response is to give you everything. Our only response is to worship you with everything that we have. 
we just thank you, Jesus, and we praise you, your mighty name. Amen. I pray this week and the next coming months and year that, that we would never grow numb to how holy God is and how separate because when, we, when you start to grasp that, it changes your day, changes how you think, changes how you live, and it changes who you worship. Thank you, New Hope. Pray you're challenged and inspired and encouraged. God loves you. Let's live. Let's live for him. Love you guys. We'll see you later. Have a great week.